Good evening uh, from Brussels. Um, tuning in, and thanks for joining us in our talk about uh, wasting time with drawings, which seems to me and Helen uh, a very fitting subject during this strange period. And we also thought this song in waiting room um, symbolizes very much uh, the boredom, but also the beauty of wasting time. And in today's uh, conversation, uh, we will focus on wasting time with drawings. But we also thought that this could be a good occasion to um, introduce shortly uh, the latest issue of uh, OASA journal, um, Practices of Drawing. Um, and uh, that we can depart from that uh, on our conversation um, of wasting time with drawings. Um, I, yeah. I, uh, I'd like to start with the fact um, that when, when we made this issue, um, as the core editorial board consisting of Veronique Paté, Janche Engels, um, me and Bart de Cross, who's part of our conversation today as well, we primarily focused on the purposefulness of the um, drawing towards the built uh, result of an architectural production. Um, but also to understand perhaps, or to have a gaze into the mental space of an architect. Uh, in other words, um, we wanted to focus in the architectural drawing um, as a practice embedded within the design process, uh, which would influence the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the architectural production and also shape it. And I guess we would all agree uh, that um, we experience uh, nowadays the era of plenty um, through social media where uh, day in, day out confronted with architectural drawings, with an abundance of them, uh, with collages, with images, you name it, and practitioners um, are uh, in search for identity in order to outstand in this abundance of images. Um, the return of handmade sketches, uh, collages, axonometric drawings, and alike, instead of realistic simulations, they, uh, they communicate a lot of information, they constantly show a lot of information. Yet this information or these documents um, do not always turn into the built reality, um, to the built objects. They do not represent that uh, uh, most of the time. In this regard, perhaps we can argue that uh, the purposefulness of the architectural drawing um, uh, has shifted um, today. But um, OASA is uh, not um, uh, a journal about actualities. It is published two to three times a year. Um, and offer some space for some rigorous investigation on thematic numbers, as you see here, a uh, few of them. Um, and uh, it takes a long time to prepare it. Uh, monthly discussions with, an, uh, with a bigger editorial board of 13 people, 12 to 13 people. And um, it is then also designed beautifully by uh, Martins and Martins, by Karl Martins and Arche Martins. Um, so each cover has its, its identity also relating to the content uh, strongly. But this, um, uh, this retreat from uh, the actuality enables us uh, um, to uh, have a very valuable space uh, to make numbers with, um, with an awareness of the ongoing discussions, but without having to go deeply into them. And this also provides us a comfort uh, to to have a zone where we can combine uh, um, contributions by practitioners and academics. Um, in this regard, uh, our auditorial focus of 105 um, on the productiveness of the drawing seemed us to be the, the correct one. Um, we did not want to make an issue uh, on architecture drawing because of its actuality. Um, on the contrary, we aimed the content that could be still hopefully relevant in another context or, uh, or in another future. And as we were experiencing recently, very clearly, very drastically, we just simply never know what the future might um, bring to us. So while preparing the call for abstracts, uh, we primarily focused uh, on the relation between the two dimensional um, drawing techniques like the elevation um, plan section, um, um, yeah, and, and axonometry perspective, and also on the medium, like the drawing um, uh, 
machines, etchings, pencils, uh, um, sketch roll. Um, these are some images from the issue of the screen, uh, computer aided design, or the sketchbook, uh, or a painting. But our um, interest was not only limited uh, to the um, to the built uh, results of, of drawings. We also tried uh, uh, to to explore uh, drawing through the drawing the mental space of an architect. Uh, that would be still uh, a place where certain principles before adaptations brought or adjustments brought by reality or by requirements of an architectural project uh, would be still detectable. So an important reference in this regard was a statement by the architect and historian Robin Evans, uh, which was architects do not make buildings, they do, uh, they make drawings of buildings. Um, and as a whole, this, uh, this issue uh, explores the gap between the drawing and the building Evans uh, argues about, uh, mainly as a starting point. And the papers offer a variety of, um, of uh, perspectives and periods uh, yet they all aim to understand uh, how the drawing functions within the process of, um, of conceiving, designing and making architecture and constructing it. Uh, and it's worth shifting the perspective from the drawing as a static autonomous document into the drawing um, which is embedded in an ongoing process. And um, among other things, process involves time and uh, Helen's contribution uh, to OAS 105 um, concentrated exactly on the notion of time seen from drawing. Um, in the issue, the text is also placed at the very end. Uh, and in my eyes, it tickles uh, the reader a little bit or elegantly to question um, the productiveness of an architectural drawing. Uh, it is a bit like a mirror which is put at the end of the issue uh, to question itself, perhaps. And that is also why we thought it would be interesting to talk about, um, about Helen's uh, contribution today and to, to elaborate on wasting time with drawings with that. So. You'll have to unmute your microphone. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, now you can hear me. Yeah, so as he's in control, I'll be has to ask her to move the slides on. So um, what we're talking about today is concerned with the opposite uh, to the productiveness of architectural drawings and their role in the design process and their relationship to the finished object. So that is drawings as instruments. Um, and the question being asked instead is how can making a drawing and also looking at a drawing give us the opportunity to waste time and what counts as wasting time. So running an architectural practice is very difficult and running it as a business has been especially challenging over the last few months. Uh, lots of people have been what we call in the UK furloughed and this is a strange concept. It makes people sound like they are fallow fields in rotation, taking some time out so that they become, become more fertile, remaining viable because they're still being paid which brings us to the relationship between time and money and many of the words that describe how we use money also describe how we use time especially in the context of our working lives but increasingly in our leisure too and i think you know spending time making time saving time and wasting time we can we can flip it over to money as well so uh, if we go to the next image so this beautiful drawing, a bit blurry here, is a working drawing by Ken Shuttleworth and David Nelson. And it's a working drawing, uh, so an instrumental drawing for the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, uh, which was completed in 1984 by Foster and Partners. So this drawing is an incredibly efficient instrument of communication and in, it, in a way an encapsulation of the idea that time is money. Uh, the colour codes are used as shortcuts to save time when under pressure. The so two architects worked out together how the different structural and service systems could come together. So the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank was an architectural project that reached fruition as a building. Um, in his essay, The Loneliness of the Project, Boris Groys points out that a lot of time is spent in our current reality devising, discussing and rejecting projects and seeking approval or funding from different public or even private authorities. 
this is something I think that architects can really identify with. There are obvious there are the obvious trials of planning permission and funding bids, but the waste of time most keenly and deeply felt is that which comes to fruition in the losing of competitions. Not only because of the unavoidable experience of hurtful rejection of a vision of a potential future, but also because the process seems in many ways a waste of intellectual and emotional energy, that is time and money. Um, so the next slide. Um, so why do any of us engage in projects at all if the business of them, the production, the competing, the assessing and rejecting of them is such a waste of time? Is it to comply with the consensus or to seek validation in the opinion of our peers or to make money? Gross has a different idea. He says each project strives for a socially sanctioned loneliness. Um, and it is a justification for self-isolation without being judged antisocial. And so I think we could view this drawing that we can see now as a project in that sense, as an act of resistance to being in the world of people. So this elevation of a morning room for Lord Leckenfield's townhouse in London was made in 1881 by Victorian architect George Aitchison. And he was a phenomenally busy man, um, a professor at the Royal Academy, president of the ROBA, <clears throat> one of the founders of SPAB, as well as working to financially support his mother and unmarried sisters. So it seems strange, at least to me, that he would take time to paint such a complete miniature rendition of the room, including every detail of the wallpaper. So Grosse's proposition seems apt here. Perhaps Aitchison was buying time for himself. So, this willful snatching of time that he could have spent more usefully, efficiently and profitably can also be considered in the light of Georges Bataille's idea of non-productive expenditure, which he first wrote about in the 1930s. Um, and this wasn't a new idea. Karl Marx had already used the term unproductive labour in his essay, Theories of Surplus Value, written in 1863. So in an essay called The Notion of Expenditure, Bataille uses this term non-productive expenditure to describe the energy that we spend when we are not being either productive or engaged in what he calls conservation or maintenance. So in other words, non-productive expenditure describes the energy that we spend when we're wasting time. This wasted time can have a destructive capacity, but it can also be a route to what Bataille called inner experience. So we can go to the next picture. The pattern field that Aitchison has painted creates a fantasy realm through which it is possible to step outside the flow of time and reality. A thicket of gold, golden brush strokes describes a repeated pattern painted over a wash of archaeological red, the colours of which congeal under a darker blood coloured smattering of blocks and splotches. Entangled in the web of gold, tiny figures dance and recline in a world that has been flattened into the smooth field of the drawing, where it is framed by the skirting board and the cornice. So Aitchison has embodied a lot of time in this drawing. For Bataille, one of the purposes of seeking inner experience through non-productive expenditure was to reach a moment of realisation that he called the privileged instant, within which there could be a movement of contestation which could dismantle all the preconceptions of what we know about the world and reality and allow it to be seen afresh. And Bataille's beautiful poetic term for this encounter was the night of non-knowledge, an insight into incompleteness. Um, to the next slide. <laughs> um, and I just put these in because I really like them, partly. But these flat fields of pattern were familiar to Aitchison through his friendship with Frederick Leighton and his interest in Islamic art. And the image on the left is um, a drawing made by Aitchison um, uh, uh, for an extension that he designed for his friend's house and studio in the late 1880s. And on the right is a drawing by an architect called William Harvey of the Alhambra, made in 1913. So the field of pattern in these architectural interiors evokes the mystical presence of God a way of accessing the anti-rational and impossible to explain that can only be grasped intuitively through what William Wordsworth called wise passiveness. Um, and can we go to the next image? So switching from time embodied in making something to the time spent in looking at it 
It is interesting to consider this fragment of a drawing by Jasper Johns called Three Flags uh, from 1959. On first sight, there are interesting analogies between this drawing and Aitchison's, especially the field of repeated gestures, organised both rigidly and loosely, each stroke having its own character. But because Johns is an artist and not an architect, the sense of embodied time is not such a palpable waste of time. The waste of time that is interesting here is that spent looking at the drawing as a process. And in the words of Geoffrey Weiss, the very tactility of the works is amplified as a property by the monochrome, wherein the instrument of seeing approaches the apparitional state. Focus becomes fixation. Fixation becomes gaze. Gaze becomes boredom. Boredom slops into a realm of suspended temporality where seeing is an operation of contemplation in the existential present sense. Next. <laughs> By making this drawing of an existing painting, Johns created an ambiguous relationship between the painting and the drawing, the opposite in a way than that between an architectural drawing and a building. So Johns is making images of things the mind already knows, or emblems such as flags, targets, numbers and letters of the alphabet. Their familiarity meant that they could be looked at in a different way. And Leo Steinberg echoes Weiss in his description of looking at a Johns image. In observing these standardised things, we sense an unfamiliar deceleration of their normal rate of existence. All of them are slowed down. As they were not mass produced in the outpouring of industry, so they no longer submit to the mechanical gestures of human users, the flipping of pages, the saluting of flags, opening a drawer, computing of numbers. Next. <laughs> This is on the on the left. This is the wallpaper in our own apartment and which is behind me here. Not, I'm not actually sitting in front of it. Um, uh, which is, and uh, embedded in this, the field are many layers of meaning and process. These start with the location of the original wall of ivy that was the inspiration for a full scale paper installation. This was photographed and then abstracted into a block print whose pattern is composed of marks of Marx's qualities are similar to that of the Aitchison painting. Uh, the next image, please. So this is the, no, the one before that, this one, yeah. So this is the last image on the theme of fields that seem flat, but which are in fact deep. It's this plain white wall in Rudolf Schwarz's church in Aachen built in 1930, about the same time that Bataille was writing about non-productive expenditure. This wall is often interpreted as an ornament-free modernist surface. Another interpretation, in fact, Schwartz himself, says that it is an equivalent, well, he doesn't say that it's an equivalent to the abundantly ornamented surfaces shown in the drawings of the Arab Hall and the Alhambra, but it's a, it's a surface that has a deep uh, contemplative uh, purpose. Um, so next image, please. <laughs> Daniel Lieberskin's intricate series of drawings called Micromegas, made in 1979, have the same dense glamour as Aitchison's drawing with its embroidery-like surfaces. An overwhelming wave of time washes over the attentive viewer. The extravagant and luxurious amount of time spent on making the drawings can also be framed within Bataille's idea of non-productive expenditure as a reality of loss without profit. And this is, I think, something quite hard for us to accept. We must always look for the profit or a good outcome if we are to consider ourselves optimistic. So potlatch is an idea that Bataille appropriates from anthropological research, which today could be viewed as a problematic and imperialistic move. Um, and the term describes a Native American custom of feasts and gift giving ceremonies used to form alliances, redistribute wealth, vanquish rivals and confirm status. In Bataille's writing, it takes on a more antagonistic quality. As a form of non-productive expenditure of enormous, exaggerated proportions offered with the goal of humiliating, defying and obligating a rival who would have to return a gift or sacrifice or property with interest, resulting in a situation where the spectacular gathering or destruction of wealth occurs. So these great competitive spectacles are, in Bataille's interpretation, sumptuary processes of social classification. So can the squandering of time and brilliance of technique can be interpreted as labour that results in social status and cultural capital? 
For Lieberskin, this was certainly the case. Some of us were, were bedazzled. Um, next. <laughs> Finally, I want to consider the idea of time not spent at all by returning to Groyce's idea of the project. Like Groyce, Bataille also describes the project as a way of being in paradoxical time in that it is a putting off of existence to a later point. In 1995, Pierre Guigues registered the Association of Free Time as a French association as defined in the 1901 Act. His stated intentions, as shown in this image on the left, were proposed, were to, were proposed the development of unproductive time, a reflection on free time, and the development of a workless society. Free time, says Hui, is, subject, is subjugated to working time. And this time left over is already commodified into desirable experiences or Instagram images, for example, that is a sledge of time consumed by us and others. Huig was interested in freed time as an alternative, but what this could be is as difficult, is difficult to define and discover. So, uh, next slide. Huig had already considered a way of capturing a sense of this elusive quality in his project Permanent Construction that he carried out in 1933. This was a photographic recording of unfinished but inhabited dwellings. For Huig, these structures were open to any and all incidents that could occur. Because the buildings were unfinished, they had not yet reached their realisation and therefore held the potential to become something else, even if they never did. The imaginary future time could therefore become embedded in the present to make a parallel present outside the forward flow of time. That's the end. Do you want to go on to your... Um, and I, I found when we were um, talking about all this in the end that your reflections uh, seem to relate at first sight to the physical time and its outcome and also the, um, the productiveness versus unproductiveness. But I also follow the light of thought what I um, know um, under the psychological time, um, which is a, in 20th century philosophy and psychology, the, the definition of time was extended into three subcategories being the physical time, um, uh, psychological time and the eternal time, especially in, in the 60s through a very much still criticized theory on physics called P theory. Uh, so the first one, this physical time, is the measurable one, as we know. Um, the time we count with clocks, uh, the time that follows a numeric sequence. The psychological time um, is the unmeasurable time, as uh, it is a subjective time in each of us, in a very individual, and, um, and it relates to psychological reality in our minds, and consequently it's also much more, um, much more abstract. And the third uh, definition was the eternal time, which dealt with the metaphysical, uh, or deals with the metaphysical, uh, and tries to grasp the idea of the God, the existence, and the un universe. Well, my personal interest um, uh, in our OASA issue lied uh, actually in entering through the through drawing into the mental space of the architect. And to follow this interest, I um, allowed myself a short reflection on a drawing of the Swiss architect Livio Vacchini, um, whose drawings from 1990s onwards um, demonstrate an extreme dryness, uh, uh, a directness in, um, in relation to his built work. In this regard, my piece uh, is, um, can be considered the complete opposite to what Alan argues about. Um, yet the reflection on Makini's drawings uh, also derived from the interest in the mental space being in the psychological time possible or perhaps detectable. So the subjective definition of time where concepts, ideas, um, principles can be set without the pressure of the um, taking time outside or, or inner existence. And, um, and uh, Wakini did not actually waste time with drawings. I think we cannot really, or it doesn't look like that at least. The, the drawings were made with very few simple means and they aim to reflect what he strived in his building. So when we look at the drawing, which was the one before this picture, 
drawing was the floor plan of this building of Lausanne Gymnasium. Uh, when we look at the drawing and the built reality, uh, they are coherent and the drawing is productive in relation to the building. Uh, Wakini's architecture deals with structure um, and its repetition and the perception of his work is very much directed by that. Um, and the precise definition of elements justify uh, their repetition in a facade like the one of La Zone Gymnasium, which has also an effect towards the interior, of course. And, and the drawings of this building uh, show um, everything what matters to it. The aimed uh, uh, purity, purification and reduction applied uh, through structure or reached through the structure. And nonetheless, the aesthetic of the building is anything else than just the sheer consequence of um, the structural calculation. Uh, in this case, the architectural appearance is controlled. Um, the aesthetics are calculated in the literal and figurative sense. Uh, but Wakini established um, this uh, uncompromising coherence between the drawing and the building, uh, rather in the, what we can call maybe second part of his career, second period. Uh, because between 1970s and 1990s, he uh, collaborated uh, with many fellow architects. Um, uh, and uh, the drawings I refer to uh, uh, differ actually a lot from the one which you're seeing right now at the screen, on the screen. Um, but during the period of, uh, of a personal reflection, it's called probably during a psychological time, um, he also decided to concentrate more on his own practice and from 1991, only Sylvia Khmer is uh, mentioned as a main collaborator on most of the projects. The other collaborations um, stopped uh, mainly. So the turning point uh, uh, here demonstrates itself uh, in a house, in a country house of Vakini himself in um, uh, Costa Tenero. It's a self-commissioned work um, based on an architectural prototype uh, for an oriented space, not for a very defined um, uh, program or activity. Uh, Roberto Maziero, um, in, in a monograph about Vakini's work, describes this uh, project as uh, a synthesis of a research um, on structural capacity, which Vakini has been actually busy from the beginning on. He's been conducting this research from the beginning of his work, um, but with the Costa Tenero House, um, the interest became central to his practice and remained so uh, in his built work until his death in um, uh, 2007. So while preparing the text, um, I uh, had the chance to talk to the Bakini studio, which is still operating and run by his daughter, Livia Bakini. And I was happily surprised to, to hear that um, the drawings, which I was, which fascinated me since since more than fifteen years, um, that they've been uh, they've been made like this from the beginning of a project. Lakini uh, insisted on his assistance um, on um, on um, making the drawings with these few elements uh, and also with the computer aided design with uh, making computer drawings. They were not made afterwards to represent, but um, they, produced, they were produced strictly with computer through the design process in order to define the building. Um, so ultimately I came to understand that uh, this, this attitude had not only to do with uh, the productiveness of the drawing, but also was concerned with, with um, building up or, or ensuring a general attitude, a very consequent one um, of the architect himself. Um, so Vakini explored uh, the possibilities of structure and, and that involved calculation. Structure involves also calculation. And in this regard, his choice of mediums, a computer aided design, every dot being calculated, put in the um, coordinate system and also is, is, is repetitive, was extremely, um, of course, productive and it, doesn't come as a surprise. It's actually also part of this kind of very consequent attitude towards own work. And it might sound like a paradox that, that um, but that's why I argued that Vakini's drawings, um, despite their rationality and calculated nature, uh, demonstrate perhaps most clearly 
uh, his mental space that existed in the psychological time, which is very hard to quantify, which is very hard to, to, uh, to also um, turn into productiveness directly. But his, his work is a result of this very meticulous thinking, um, which is also not clear in which time frame it, it happened. It could, it, some, for some projects, it could have been years, for others, months, and some of them were maybe a moment of Eureka, and, um, and then it depends just on the project, I guess. Uh, but in the, end of, in the end, actually, the career of an architect spans a very uh, long physical time, but I think even a longer and bigger psychological time um, in which we can afford, I suppose, wasting time with drawings. Um, as Helen was arguing with this image. Uh, so I would like to go um, over to Bart's remarks on that because I'm sure you have some after these two very different examples. <laughs> Indeed. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Bart, and as Alice mentioned, I'm co-editor of the issue. Um, and I'm here to reflect more or to open up the, the conversation about the, these two contributions to the issue. And I'd like to return first to the, the title of this, um, of this talk, Wasting Time. And I think, Helen, you said at the beginning of your talk, what exactly is wasting time? Um, how can we understand this? And maybe to, to put things um, a bit in perspective and, and drawing back to what Asa said at the beginning, the main idea or one of the ambitions of the OASA issue, or one of the reasons we, we made this issue was to focus on the, um, the connection between drawing and building. And this was a kind of, this idea was a kind of response to the late 20th century idea of the autonomy of the architectural drawing. And we wanted to, to question again um, what the instruments, the techniques, the media for drawing uh, do within the design process, to what extent uh, they define the way we think about architecture, the, the kind of architecture we can conceive, and to what extent they also influence the qualities of the built environment. And so, of course, in this, this, this is a question into a very productive uh, agency of the drawing, you could say. And in this context, to me, it's, it's, it was very interesting, your contribution, uh, which precisely questioned this and which, which proposed to examine the nature of wasting time or of the, the non-productive expenditure. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm wondering to what extent um, this idea is linked to a kind of idea of the autonomy of the architectural drawing, but also to what extent this is perhaps um, fundamental or, or inevitable in the act of drawing, uh, to what extent that even in the, in the, as Osler argued, even in the very rational drawings of, of Akini, there's a kind of expenditure, a kind of non-productive expenditure. But also, you started your talk with um, suggesting that that we talk the same way about time as about money and that time to a certain extent is money but to a certain extent it's it's not the same so to what extent is wasting time different from wasting money Turn on micro. you'll have to unmute your microphone helen um, uh, I don't think that drawing is also always a, um, a, a, a process of wasting time. Um, I think that Aitchison definitely was deliberately mm, escaping. Um, but I mean, for example, the drawing I showed of the Hong Kong Shanghai building, that was a, a drawing that was completely about saving time and, and contracting time and with an incredibly intense uh, way of communicating. So I don't think that, that, that necessarily drawing is, I mean, that there are many ways to waste time um, or to, you know, to, to, to use time in a contemplative way. Um, so I think that's one thing. Um, but I, I, I don't, I think that this issue of time and money being equal is kind of 
the crux of what, what, I, what I wanted to talk about in a way, because um, we associate being productive with, with, with uh, making money. And I think that there are other ways to be productive. Would you hinted at at the end of your article and of your presentation when you uh, mentioned that drawings, even though um, they might be seen as a kind of uh, non-productive expenditure in the economic sense, that they become a kind of cultural capital? Well, as in the Libra skin, or yeah. yeah, I mean, I think um, I mean, so there seems to be an inescapability of of being productive almost or to what extent um well that's a good that's a good question I and mean, i think it's i mean everyone has a different interpretation of this but i think it is very difficult to escape i mean for us and i think that's in a way what's quite fascinating about this idea of the night of non-knowledge that you, you know i think we're so embedded in this idea that our time has to be spent productively um in some way and that's why you know the the comments that i made about you know if we if we don't see something productive in everything that we do we seem to be pessimistic you know, it's a it's a it's a it's a to be optimistic you'll see value in everything but why does everything have to have a value even um you know i mean and that's a, you know time has a value and money is value um, and maybe it's first of all can we can we find a different set of values and secondly does value have to exist at all i guess but Lieberskin certainly um I mean, whether he even made the drawings himself is another question, but but this kind of like um, extravagant um, representation of waste or spent time um, definitely um, was something that brought back um, cultural capital for him. Yeah, it was valuable. It wasn't wasted. Mm -hmm. Well, what you said about the the. Um the almost inescapability of of being productive i guess it's 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 to me it seems very relevant in the current uh context to talk about this mm -hmm. uh since we're all still in some kind of version of a of a lockdown and mm -hmm. which to a certain extent has has postponed a lot of things or has has um um deadlines got exponed, uh, postponed um Communication seems smaller than usual, uh, slower. Uh, events got postponed. Mm -hmm. And so to a certain extent, and at least that's how I experience this too, is that there's, a, there's a, an additional amount of free time. And at the same time, there seems to be this, this pressure to be productive, to do something with this. Mm -hmm. and it, to me, it feels this, this idea of wasting time becomes uneasy in a way. Uh, in a context where it might be um, more relevant to do so. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Aslan, maybe, maybe you can reflect on this. Yeah, well, I think, you know, time becomes very flexible in this kind of periods. And you know, if, you're, if you're blocked of doing something, and that, of course the, the overall feeling at the beginning of this period was that you have time as you never had before. I experienced it personally differently. I mean, time doesn't mean for me that I can produce more uh, because sometimes I have no time and I can produce a lot because that is what I was trying to also but argue for the psychological time or the mental space is, it can be loose from the physical time you have. In that sense, yes, the pressure of being productive, I heavily question if it has to be there because um, it is not, it, 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 a lot of space doesn't give you more ideas necessarily it doesn't give you also more um more insights you might read more you might draw more but um if time becomes so flexible and so long and and as we have never thought that we'll be stuck at home for three months i think i've never had that in my life i mean probably when i was a kid but not even then uh, so if time becomes so unimaginably broad then you start to lose your focus and to force in a productiveness into it is, is uh, in my eyes, doomed to fail. And then, of course, you can start to question if that's even necessary. So, um, uh, and I felt very uneasy about it. Meanwhile, after 12 weeks, I feel very easy about it. There's no problem at all. <laughs> kind of. And uh, because in a way, it, 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 it happens somehow outside of you. 
you know, there's no control about that. And I know that this is something that I don't, I'm not, sorry to drop you in it, Martina, but I know this is something that you, that Martina Bischoff, who's here as well, that she looked up with her students about, you know, this issue of uh, non-productive time or freed time when we're not doing something, we're not being productive, it's actually very difficult to grasp what it could be. And, it, and I, I don't know, what did you find, Martina, when you were looking at that with the students? Um, well, actually, our students, um, they did not feel uh, very, they felt actually uh, the pressure of um, having tasks that we put upon them. So they did not, like many of them mentioned that they would not sense uh, a sort of uh, being able to be unproductive or the topic of the semester was linked to these uh, things we are discussing here, the non-productiveness or the, um, the, the notions of free time and so on, but they did exactly not uh, really feel like they have a lot of space to to um, evolve their creative potential within this free time topic and um, I was especially working on a reading circle or we did uh, we did uh, I worked with a with our student group at ETH in Zurich with a uh, with the uh, readings and we wanted them to, we have introduced a reading circle that asked the students to performatively deal with the contents of uh, 10 texts, um, the 10 texts of our readers, including your text, Helen. This approach was, uh, um, we soon realized, this approach, we realized, introduced a playful uh, approach also, which maybe um, open space to be productive in a way that would not directly link to producing architecture. Mm -hmm. I thought this could be sort of something to be mentioned here and mm -hmm. considering the outcomes of uh, some of the students elaborations um, I would strongly suspect there were many joyful and maybe even sensual aspects to this concentrated process of inventing a known presentation or even an interpretation of these texts, which students often wouldn't dare to express while close reading, yeah. for example. I mean, there were groups of, um, groups, for example, they read a part of Henry Thoreau's Walden, and those four students, for example, while performing, let us, the Zoom group, wait in front of our screens at nine o'clock in the morning. And um, well, uh, what, we, what did we do while waiting? 15 minutes later, they sent us a picture of a piece of forest where they have been sitting while letting us stay in a slot of free time. So basically, um, we were thinking of what the heck are we doing here? And we had this kind of... I mean, I think that's what Bart's saying in a way. It's a, it's a feeling of unease and discomfort that actually this free time, yeah, not something, we always think it's a, it's being something contemplative and, and we also, more like... And we also you know, always realise that uh, we have this space because very often we have it and we feel, as you say, discomfortable. Mm. Uncomfortable with not being productive. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> I, I know that Finn. I know that Finn's here. I, I noticed, and, and he's. I know he's interested in this idea of um, of. Uh, well, you ha you have a different word for it. You call it um, depons, don't you, Finn? I can't. Um, I might. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, I, I, hello, I'm Finn. I curated the Oslo Architecture Triennale last year, which was all about degrowth. Um, degrowth in relation to architecture. Degrowth is the sort of economics of an economy that is designed to shrink rather than to grow. And the cornerstone of how economists think of a, a growing economy is a productive economy. So when, when economists talk about productivity, what they mean is how much... I as an individual can add to GDP in how little time. Um, and so I just thought, it, Helen kind of asked me to kind of 
weigh in from a from a kind of degrowth point of view who, who I guess, I guess degrowth thinkers have been sort of exploring the potential of unproductivity um, as a, a positive a, 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 a ambition for, for a long time. So maybe I can just share my screen and jump into like a couple of thoughts. Oops. So can you see um, a sort of spreadsheet? Yeah. Yeah, so this is, um, this is just a sort of like ranking of, of, of some of the most productive economies in the world in, in terms of how much they add to GDP. So that these are co economies where time is not wasted at all, right? This is kind of the exact opposite of what you've, you've been talking about, economies where everybody is really, really good at not wasting their time. Um, but I guess this sort of question of, okay, what, it, what is GDP? Um, GDP is just a measure of all the trade that takes place in, a, in an economy in a particular region. Um, it was invented to finance the invasion of Ireland by Oliver Cromwell, the kind of precursor to what we call GDP, was um, this kind of a new economic product that uh, Cromwell needed to, in order to, um, to raise the capital to fund the army to invade Ireland. Um, so it's a, a, a part of English colonialism, colonial history is the kind of creation of this, this tool, but we still use it today. Uh, I'm gonna skip through a couple of these. The problem is that, um, ah, here we go. Now the problem is that as we grow GDP, as we grow our economies, we are also growing uh, our carbon emissions. And this graph shows a very strong correlation between um, growing economies and growing carbon emissions. In fact, the only time in the last uh, decades when um, carbon emissions have come down, net global carbon emissions have come down, is during recessions, when economies have been shrinking, when people have uh, wasted their time, right? They haven't been able to contribute productively to the economy. Um, and so they, 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 uh, their, their labor hasn't been able to be channeled into economically productive outcomes. Um, and as a result, uh, the glo our global carbon emissions have come down. Um, and so this is a kind of intriguing question because I, uh, I've, I've been looking at this for a few years now and uh, I find it very hard to come to any other conclusion that we have to find a way to shrink the economy. We have to find a way to become less productive, right? We, we as a species have become so good at converting resources into products and so good at converting relationships into services that we're actually wrecking the planet, wrecking our mental health, wrecking our kind of capacity to um, uh, kind of continue to exist in uh, and have a good life and so uh, I, I, I'm sort of increasingly thinking that actually wasting time isn't just something that's kind of like a nice thing to think about or, or kind of gives you a, a new uh, perspective to, to reflect on how you use your your life on earth it's actually really urgent that we all get a whole lot better at wasting time um, and so there's just a few projects that I'll kind of flash through that I think hint at many ways that architecture could participate in a conversation about wasting time. Um, these are the Here Here's. They were a project by Studio Weaver a, a while ago in the grounds of Kendleston Hall. Um, they are essentially these kind of giant trumpets that explore the landscape. Um, and they enable the user to do very little at all. They're just sort of, they're kind of um, uh, a bit like viewing platforms, but for sound, they're kind of auditory vistas. And so they're an excuse to spend some time somewhere beautiful, maybe doing nothing, just kind of taking in um, the landscape around you, uh, being completely unproductive and entirely kind of um, passive receiver of the world rather than a productive contributor to it. Um, this is all a bit of about Batai. Uh, I, I think that um, death and grieving is a really interesting example of 
ways that architects have historically helped humans to kind of burn their time in economically unproductive ways. Um, so like, you know, this, this is just, it's interesting that a tombstone as a piece of art has no resale value, right? It's very different to other kinds of artistic output that you can own, that you could sell, that might go up or down in value depending on, on how rare or precious they are. Tombstones, once you've bought them, um, that's it, they've gone. There's no secondhand value for a, for a grave. Um, they are a kind of waste of time. And yet, clearly, uh, the, the kind of importance of grief transcends any kind of measurable output, uh, measurable economic output of, of the energy uh, that you might put into designing um, Jeremy Beadle's bespoke tombstone or Sandy Wilson's tombstone that references uh, his British library. Um, da, 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 flip forward a bit. Uh, here's another example. This is um, this is in Northern Ireland. This is a, a um, uh, one of many bonfires. Um, a kind of folk architecture. Um, these are not nice things. Uh, these are made to intimidate Catholics. Uh, and every year, um, Protestant communities build these gigantic bonfires. There's an effigy of um, the Sinn Féin politician Jerry Adams hanging from one of them and then they're burned up in this kind of triumphalist um, ritual um, and uh, a project I like that kind of um, takes that this kind of slightly toxic tradition and tries to invert it it's is David's Best's temple in Derry in Northern Ireland which was built um, with Catholics and Protestants from either side of the valley working together to make um, this, uh, this temple, this kind of elaborate timber structure, uh, extraordinarily beautiful, weird bit of architecture that then of course was burned up, um, uh, kind of mimicking this, this, this bonfire tradition. Um, an enormous waste of time, you could argue, literally nothing left uh, at the end of it, the entire project consumed um, by fire. And yet uh, the whole point of it was, um, that through these two communities spending time together and spending time working on this thing that they would then destroy together, it might actually somehow be a cathartic way to work through some of the resentment of the civil war in Northern Ireland and the, and, and, um, the violence that has kind of plagued this, this city, but the, the country in particular, uh, the nation for some years. Um, and then maybe just a, a few kind of cuter examples to finish on. Um, I think that we can find a lot of uh, examples of like small bits of architecture that help, that have helped people throughout history to waste time um, through cultural rituals uh, without any kind of economic output attached to them. Um, so maypoles are quite a nice example, kind of structures that are made around Europe um, to mark uh, the changing of the seasons, um, uh, this one's in Austria, this, this one's in the UK, um, and which could have served no productive output. You know, you can't shelter under them. They don't help you to bring in the harvest or anything. Uh, they are um, a total waste of time. And yet, uh, through their creation and through the kind of funny rituals that it built up around them, quite elaborate structures, in this case, this kind of woven pattern can, can form. And so I'm interested in, in not just architecture that enables us to waste time, but maybe um, architecture which is produced through the wasting of time. Um, and maybe the final example I wanted to uh, share was a cairn. Cairn is a, a, you know, a, 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 way, a piece of wayfinding infrastructure. Uh, you find them all over the world. They're, they're piles of rocks that are made and maintained to mark routes in remote places. Um, and what I find fascinating about the cairn is that there is no commissioning client. You can't sell a cairn. No one owns a cairn. No one drew a map or a plan and said, here's where we should put the cairns. Um, they, no money exchanges hands or, or you know, 
in, in sort of in economic terms, they're utterly useless. They're not productive at all. And yet, um, if you are lost in the fog, you can make out the shape of a cairn in the gloom and it can guide you back to a, a safe track down. So something that's economically unproductive, that is kind of a waste of time by, by kind of the usual metrics that we use, can in fact save your life. Um, and what could be more useful than that? So, my, yeah, Mike, sorry, I, I hope that was kind of what you were hoping for, oh, Helen, but my, my kind of point is that we as a species are too productive, we're too good at destroying the planet, and we've got to start getting better at wasting our time before we channel that energy into uh, a cause that we will ultimately come to regret. No, that was great, Finn. Thanks a lot. I mean, it, it's really good to... Um to take a view of, on this uh, non-productive time and uh, wasting time and, and how important it is. Um, and I'm, I was going to say, I'm handing over to Ellis now, um, instead of taking charge, um, to see if other people wanted to, to say anything or ask any questions. Um, yeah, if we have questions, then pitch them in the chat box and I will give you the mic. Um, or any kind of comments. I mean, there are probably some other contributors to the issue of our I think, in the room. Um, but if nothing's coming forward... <laughs> nothing's coming forward. I can um, <laughs> I, I, so my friend yeah. Igor Tarani Lalik was arguing in The Spectator the other week that the only artwork that matters is one that reduces GDP, which uh, is causing great kind of consternation. <laughs> How do you do that? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we don't have Igor tonight. Um, if there are no other questions, I feel we are going to wrap up. Um, but we have um, at nine o'clock tonight, UK time, uh, Alicia Pavaro is over on Instagram uh, reading uh, from Colin Ward's Anarchy in Action. Uh, Colin Ward has been a recurring figure throughout the 100 Day Studio so far, uh, English um, anarchist writer. Um, and uh, I would recommend highly Ken Walpole's contribution earlier in the season about uh, about uh, Ward's writing about children. Um, but when when is the is the is the, when is the issue of Oasa out? Is it in the shops as it were now? It's already out. And, it? um, yeah, it is already out since a uh, few weeks. Yeah. So, um, I think via the website is the easiest to find out where to find it. 